I really first uh, heard about Metropolitan Anthony from my mother, who was here. She had his books on the bookshelves at home. Uh, my grandmother in England, my Anglican grandmother in England, used to say she listened to his broadcasts on the BBC in those days when he was doing them. Uh, he, of course, is not only popular, but um, very widely respected all through Russia uh, these days. His books we have in the, the bookstore in the back, if there are any left. Um, so it's more than an honor. It's a tremendous uh, privilege that uh, he is here and talking to us on the subject of prayer, and particularly the difficulties of prayer. Uh, Bolton and One or two preparatory remarks. First of all, as you already know, and as you will discover very fast, I'm no theologian. And so I will give a talk as a parish priest with a certain number of years of experience, and you will have to endure it. A number of years ago, I asked one of our outspoken old parishioners in London what she thought of my talks, and she said, Oh, Father Anthony, we are like the dreams of an old horse during a summer night. So that is all you can expect from me today. <laughs> On the, the second thing I would like to say is that I'm not going to try and give a learned talk, but say the things which I would say to ordinary parishioners and ordinary people about prayer. And the last thing, you are protected by my timer here that will ring after 45 minutes and make me silent. <laughs> <laughs> this being said, I was asked in the first place to speak to you about the prayer of a lay person. And I want to make a comment on the expression because I believe it is important. We are used to divide people in the church between lay people and clergy. And this is a very unfortunate distinction. In Russian it's even worse because Miriam speaks of being a person that belongs to the world as distinct from a person that belongs to the church or the kingdom. If you turn to the writings of St. Paul and of the Fathers, you will discover quite easily that to be a layman means to be a member of the laws, the people of God. And in that sense, whether you are a member of the clergy or whether you are uh, a member of the congregation, you are on the same terms as far as God is concerned. We are all God's own people with different positions, different gifts, different, different functions. But basically, we are one and the same. And I remember how it was brought to my mind a number of years ago when I was invited to speak to a conference that excluded the presence of clergy. And when I expressed my surprise, I was told, you will understand later. I was introduced by the chairman who said, Father Anthony is a layman of the Orthodox Church in Episcopal order. I think it was a very good, apt theological statement. 
because we are all members of the laws of God's people and within this membership we have different functions. As far as our prayer life is concerned, a member of the clergy has got one peculiar space which is his, the celebration of the sacraments. And even then, it is not he who is the celebrant, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the Holy Spirit. He makes visible and audible what invisibly and inaudibly is accomplished by the power of God himself. And in that sense, he merges into the laws that fills the church. He is at one, only that he proclaims aloud in gesture and in word what invisibly is performed by God himself. So that what I would have to say about prayer applies to clergy and to lay people exactly in the same way if you leave aside the particular role of the clergy in the sacramental life. Another introductory remark concerns the word prayer, the expression we use. We use the word prayer in a way which is misleading very often. Because in modern languages, praying means practically begging, asking for something, or when it is not begging or asking for something, if we express gratitude or joy, it is also always, as it were, addressed to a superior being who has power, greatness, while we are nothingness. This is something which we must forget once and for all if we approach God. We discovered that in early immigration. I belong to that antiquated body because I find myself with my parents in immigration in 1920 when I was a boy of seven. And in that generation, the generation of my parents and my own, we discovered something about the Lord Jesus Christ which one practically not perceived before where we went, we were in Russia. In Russia, we went to cathedrals and to churches. They were great, solemn places. The services also were great and solemn. The priests occupied an outstanding place. And the people were an assembly of people who had gathered there to be faced with the greatness of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, and gathered there to thank God for all he was doing. When we found ourselves in immigration, we found ourselves at the bottom of the trough. The poverty was extreme. The need was incredibly great. There was physical hunger, physical homelessness, and what was worse, estrangement. We were superfluous. We were not needed. We should not have been there at a period when the West itself was in a financial and economic crisis. When we began to create churches, we could not create cathedrals. We created little corners where we could be together with God. The first church that played a decisive role in my life in Paris had 
a screed of plywood and icons of paper. But the priests were of gold. There was hunger and homelessness among them. But they served. And what we discovered in these churches that were so poor, so desolate, was that God lived in them with the same fullness as he had lived in the great cathedrals. He needed not a cathedral to be in our midst. He was one of us. More than this, we could not fall lower than he, because however low we fell, we found the Lord God with his arms outstretched, ready to receive us in his arms and to protect us. We discovered a God who was not the God of the great cathedrals, who one approached with awe, with fear, like beggars, but a God who was one of us, who had chosen to be one of us, and whom we could approach as such. And that made a great difference to our sense of prayer, because prayer was no longer begging. Prayer was a moment of wonderful encounter. Prayer, as a whole of the spiritual life, could be understood as an encounter with the living God. An encounter, not with a superior being before whom we had to tremble, before whom we had to kneel down in awe, but someone who had so much loved the world and each of us that he had become one of us and one with us. And praying became something very different. When we turned to the prayers which were offered us by the saints, they appeared to us in a new light. It was no longer a service of prayers which we offered God in order to endear ourselves to Him or to become acceptable to Him. It was prayers which had been born out of the need, out of the tragedies of life, out of the love of real people, people like us, turning to God. And we began to see these prayers in a new light. It was not a matter of reading these prayers or learning them by heart to recite them to God in order to placate Him or to attract upon us His condescension and His love. It was a matter of learning how the greatest soul in the world had approached God, how they had seen Him, how they had seen themselves, how they had seen life, and how they expressed this total, complex experience to the living God who had chosen to become one of us through the Incarnation. And so, what we were taught was not to read in the morning and the evening a rule of prayer and feel that God must be content with that, that we had done our duty to God. It was a question of learning from these great men and women how one meets the living God and how one can speak to Him. This is something which I would like to insist on. Pray, first of all, an attempt at an encounter. But an encounter usually, when it happens between people, happens between two concrete persons who can perceive one another. 
we don't always perceive the divine presence. When is the encounter then? The encounter is in an act of faith. And what I would suggest is that, that before any one of us says a word of prayer, we take our stand alone. We can stand or sit or lie. That does not matter. Because God, as Saint Ambrosio of Optima says, does not look at the legs of people but at heart. Take our stand before God and say to him, Lord, in your humility, in your love for mankind, in your readiness to save me among others, I know that you are present here and that you allow me to be present. I may not perceive this presence, but I know it in an act of faith. You are here, and I do not know whether I deserve any sign of your presence, but you are here, and you allow me to be here with you. And then keep quiet, silent, immobile, knowing that you are in God's presence. There is an illustration to that condition in the life of a Western saint, the Curé d'Ars, who was the parish priest of a small French parish near Dijon and Lyon. He used to go to his chapel and found there an old man sitting hour after hour. And one day he said, Granddad, what are you doing here? You sit here, you are looking straight ahead, your lips do not move in prayer, your fingers do not run along your rosary. What are you actually doing? And the old man answered, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy together. This is where prayer begins and where prayer ends. Without doing this, if we read aloud or silently the prayers of the saints with going into their experience, we are trying to buy the attention of God. I will offer you so many prayers, so many acapis, so many other prayers, and in response you will have to do something for me. I remember many years ago, I lived under a very strict rule of prayer. And one day I went to my spiritual father and he said to me, do you pray a great deal? And I was praying a great deal, and I said so. And what happens if we come, you come back from work so exhausted that you cannot pay attention to the words of prayer and collapse with tiredness and have to go to bed without finishing your room? What do you feel? Are you feel? Do you feel safe? I said, well, I feel uneasy. I said, so, you think that by offering to God so many prayers that gushed out of the hearts of saints like blood out of the wound, you buy his attention, you buy his concern. You say to him, I'll give you these prayers which others spoke from the heart only with my lips, and you will be content and you must look after me. I said, I'm afraid, yes. Well, I forbid you for a year to pray. You make a sign of the cross before going to bed and say the prayers of those who love me, Lord, save me. And then you go to bed and you begin to ask yourself, who are the people 
who love me enough for me to feel safe in their love and perhaps in their prayers. And whenever a name or a face emerges before you, say, Oh God, bless this person. And say that with all the gratitude you can find in your heart that there is one person and another and another who loves you enough for you to be safe without praying. That taught me something which I treasure, which I have tried to convey by saying we must find our way of taking our stand before God without asking Him to make Himself present, without doing anything, simply knowing He is here, I am here, and this is the greatest gift and happiness I can have. That is where prayer begins. And children know that. I remember a little boy in our parish whose ma mother was inordinately pious and who read the evening prayers and the morning prayers with him daily. And once after the ordeal in the evening, you can imagine the little boy understood nothing of the Slavonic or the prayers anyhow. He turned to his mother and said, now that we have finished praying, could we pray a little to God? <laughs> <laughs> and to his surprise, mother, he said, God, thank you that the day is ended. I am so tired and I want to sleep. Amen. <laughs> I have another example of the way in which a child can have a direct uh, sense of things. The little son of one of the well-known Oxford professors who has become eventually a professor himself, when he was six, was standing before the icons, his mother was sitting here and I was sitting there. It was immediately after Easter and he said, Christos was Christus, Mertus, 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 Sushi, Magravet, Jevon, Darla. And he repeated that once and twice and another time. And his mother said to him, stop it. When come to that, it's impious. And with the greatness of the child, he turned to her and said, you understand nothing. He is very happy. <laughs> and he was right. This is what we must recapture if we want to pray. Not learn as many prayers as possible, but to learn to stand before God knowing that He loves us, that He is listening to us, to our silence. He is listening to what is happening deeper than words and feeling in us. Listening to our happiness and being allowed to be in His presence. But then, of course, we must learn also to use the prayers of saints. But the prayers of saints were not written by them before a writing table. They gushed out of them on occasion of an event or as the fulfillment of years of experience, as blood gushes out of the wound. Do we perceive their prayers like this? When we repeat one of those, those prayers mechanically, do we participate in the experience from which it was born? Not always to be optimistic, hardly ever to be true. What we must learn is to treat these prayers as an encounter with the spiritual experience of another person who shares it with us. If we take a prayer of any of the saints, the evening prayers, the morning prayers, any other prayer, they speak of a moment when a saint had a direct sense of the presence of God and wanted to tell him something that was true and mattered. 
let us take one of these prayers and ask ourselves. First of all, have any sense that I'm in God's presence, or the invisible presence of God. And then, what can I say to him? I can recite this prayer. Is it a prayer that will be true? Or a lie? Or in emptiness? If you take any of the prayers of the saints, you'll say that this phrase, I can say sincerely, yes, I know what he was saying, and I experience it, I know it. Another passage will come, we say that, I have no idea of what it refers to. I cannot uh, read it to God as though it was mine. I must Lord, say, Lord, the saint has said these words. They must be true. I must ponder on them. I must live with these words. Try to understand them. Try to share his experience. And only then shall I be able to be honest and frank in my addressing you. And other passages, we will have to say, no, that I cannot say honestly, and I shall not, because it would be an insult to God. And I'll give you a couple of examples which are not to my honor at all. When I was a young man, teenager, I quarreled with a close friend of mine. I felt the quarrel was the end. Never shall I make my peace with him. I went to my spiritual father and said, I have a problem. I said it to him rather lightly because I expected from him a solution. I have a problem. When I come in the Lord's Prayer to the words, forgive as I forgive, I have a difficulty. Because shall I add, and yet, never, never shall I forgive Kirill. <laughs> Father Fanasi looked at me, candidly, out of his wisdom and said, there is no problem. When you come to this passage, you say, Lord, don't forgive me, because I shall never forgive Kirill. <laughs> I said, but I can't do that. I want to be forgiven. He shrugged his shoulders and said, you can't do otherwise, goodbye. <laughs> I went home and reached the moment when I had to read the Lord's Prayer. When I came to this passage, I could not ask God to pile up burning coals on my head. So I stopped and I went back to Father Hanassi. Explained. He said, well, it's very simple. You jump over this passage. I tried to jump. It didn't work. Because I wanted to be forgiven. I didn't want to show how beautifully and artistically I could jump. I returned again. And as he said to me, all right. Would you feel now sorry enough for your condition, your condition, to say to God, Forgive me to the extent to, the, to which I wish I could forgive Kirill. I said, yes, that I can do. And I did that over a period. Then it became easier. And it ended after half a year. You see, the hardness of my heart. In my being able to say, forgive as I forgive and we made peace together. So you see that there is in each prayer a challenge, and you have no right to recite it for God's uh, uh, pleasure. It's very important. Never say to God anything which are untrue, because he rejects it, he cannot accept it. But then there are occasions when your faith is even, I wouldn't say worse than what I said, but as bad. Another example out of my life. So you see, uh, I'm no example of prayer for virtue. <laughs> A moment came when we lived in London many years ago with my mother and grandmother. Then our house were 
infested with mice. They ran about everything. We didn't know what to do because we did not want to put mouse traps because we felt sorry for the mice. But we were afraid of throwing around little piece of bread with um, poison because we were afraid for my grandmother who was in her 90s would see a little piece of bread, collect it, eat it. And I didn't know how close her health was to that of a mouse. And then I remembered that in the big Trebnik, the big book of prayers, there is an admonition written by one of the saints of all, addressed to all the nuisances of the world. It begins with lions and tigers, in, um, ends with insects, and en route, you meet a variety of animals. Among them, mice. I looked at that and thought, I can't believe that a mouse will listen to an admonition. <laughs> but who knows? This thing wasn't a fool. He wasn't a comedian. He must be knowing, uh, have been knowing what he was doing. So I thought, I'll try. I put my stall on, sat on my bed, put the big book on my knees, and waited. And a mouse, yes, and I had a word with the saint. I said, look, I don't believe in a word of this admonition. I don't believe that any mouse or tiger or elephant or um, insect would ever understand what you say or do it. But if you believe in that, I will say the words in the Master's hearing and you will bring the prayer into God's hearing. So I will have nothing to do in it, with it except reading the prayer. The act of faith will belong to the Master and the prayer will belong to you. And I said, and indeed, a little Master came, trotty trotty, out of the fireplace. I made the sign of the cross on it and said, sit still and listen. And the first miracle occurred. It sat up like this, whiskers moving, and didn't much. I read the admonition, made the sign of the cross, and said, now go and tell the other ones. It fell in its fall, disappeared in the fireplace, and all the mice disappeared. <laughs> well, I'm telling you this story because it says nothing complimentary about my faith. But it does say something about the fact that the saint who writes a prayer had the faith, total. And so, if you would take any prayer or your book of prayer, read the name of the saint which is in the beginning and say St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, St. Theophrastus, whoever it is. I will read your prayer uh, commenting on it to be honest and you will bring it to God. I have no faith to match your prayer. But you take it and bring it. And then you start and say the few words and try to say them truthfully. If the words are such that you can say them yourself, good. If the words are such that you can say them in an act of faith, say so. I know nothing about this. I do not feel anything about this, O oh Lord. But I know that this saint was right. I will say these words, bring them to my heart, yourself, so that one day they may become mine. And then there will be passages like, forgive as I forgive, which you will not be able to say, and say, Lord, I cannot say these words. They are not mine. This is immensely important because if 
anything should happen between you and God, it must be an encounter in truth, not in politeness, not in um, false devotion. It must be true. And if you are true, you will meet God. If, by any chance, you are not praying privately, but praying for others to hear, then another problem occurs. The prayers which you read must hit you at the heart if you hope that will hit anyone else at the heart. There is, forgive me for the quotation, a Zen saying that if an archer wants to fly an arrow at a target, it will never hit the, the center of it unless it pierces his heart at the same time. Obviously, it's an image. What it means is that if what you say does not hit you at the heart, there is no reason why it should hit anyone else's at the heart. And that is a very serious problem. Because when you read these prayers aloud, there is first all the problem which I have tried to indicate first about you receiving the message and responding. The prayers of this saint must hit you like an arrow at the heart and you must respond. But also, unless it hits you at the heart, no one should be hit, short of a miracle. But you cannot count on miracles in that respect. You have to take your own responsibility for it. So, when we come to reading prayers, here are the conditions. They are very serious. Should we read all the prayers? Is it a question of presenting to God the totality of the service? No. What God wants is your heart. Child, give me your heart. All the rest I can add to it, says one of the books of the Old Testament, one of the Apocrypha. It is essential to remember that. I'm sorry, I lost uh, my thread. Anyhow, in a way, we must treat the prayers of the saints in the same manner as we treat music, the music of the great composers. If you think of the way in which music is born, there is a revelation of beauty that reaches the composer. This revelation is beyond him, but he tries to encompass it in a spiritual and emotional and intellectual experience. And it becomes part of him. Then he tries to express it in sound that corresponds uh, to the experience itself, that conveys the experience. And then he may write it down. And it ends in little signs on a sheet of paper. Someone who knows nothing about music sees the signs and understands nothing. Someone who is a beginner begins to understand the sound that is hidden within the signs. When you gain ground beyond the sound, you begin to perceive the whole melody. Beyond it, you see it wide, deepen, encompass what you never thought of, and gradually you experience, or to whatever extent you are capable of experiencing it, 
the musical experience of the uh, composer. The same is true about the, the prayers of saints. You have them as a text. You must understand the text. And this is something which um, is of immense experience because the texts were written in one language. We read them in another language. And at times, the words have changed their meaning to an incredible degree. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy is a begging cry. If you turn to the Greek or to the Hebrew, it means, Lord, pour out the oil of your compassion, the oil of your tenderness on me. Lord, have mercy means, Lord, pour out on me your love and tenderness. It does not mean, don't look at my misdeeds and say, he is incapable of anything better, let me forgive him. No, we expect love, and we must respond by love. The same is true about other words. I have no time to go uh, into uh, the words which we use. But when we say Lord, usually our reaction is to think, oh yes, he is the Lord of all, of all. It's not quite what all it means. Because indeed he is the Lord of all. But if I turn to Christ and say, Lord, it means I am choosing you to be the Lord of my life. You are Lord by my free choice. And it is to him, to such a Lord, that I turn in total loyalty, wholeheartedly, with all my faith and my devotion. That makes a lot of difference whether he is the objective overlord or the one whom you have chosen to be the guide, the love, the content of your life. And one can read in most prayers an endless line of words which must be understood as they were meant by the writer. I think I will suggest to each of you to reread the evening prayers, the morning prayers, or whatever prayers you like, and ask yourself, what do they mean to me? What is it that this word conveys to me? Another example, when you say, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. Universally, I'm told, yes, Our Father means mine together with all those who surround me, which is good enough, provided I treat everyone else around me as my brothers and sisters. The fact that he's the father of all of us doesn't mean that I'm the brother of all, or the sister of all of them. But there is more to it. When Christ was asked to teach his disciples how to pray, he says, pray in the following way. Our Father who art in heaven. And this our Father meant mine and yours. Not only yours as a collectivity, but mine and yours. It establishes the brotherhood that is between you and Christ. And this is not a heretical uh, phrasing, because he says to the more uh, bearing women, go and tell my brothers that I'm written. Yes, when we say our Father, we must think that I accept everyone else as my brother and sister. Not as Cain accepted Abel, but as Christ 
accept each of us. And also, that if Christ is my brother, what kind of brother must I be and become to him? That is essential. It means, at times, a total change of life. It means a reorientation of life, at least. It means determination. It means faithfulness. It means seeing Christ in a new way. And then we can turn to God and say, Our Father, because I am the brother of the only begotten Son, with all its consequences, in faith, in life, in everything. These are things which we do not reflect enough upon. And if we approach our praying in this way, then we will realize that we may not be able to lead a whole service for God's benefit in the evening or in the morning. But we must learn to lead a little bit for our benefit. And Teofan de Cruz writes about it when he says that if you want to pray, ask yourself how much time you have for prayer. Put your alarm clock and then take the first prayer. If on the second line you are hit at the heart by what it says, stay with it. Stay with it. Repeat these words. Dwell on them. Allow them to go deep into your heart, to transform your heart and mind, to redirect your will. And if all of a sudden you hear the alarm clock, say, I have read all the prayers of, the, of Vespers, or the evening prayers, because you have prayed, which is much more important than read them. God has heard them millions of times coming from people who shouted them out of agony, out of joy. It's not that that interests him. May I uh, speak a little longer than my 45 minutes? <laughs> well, um, this is practical uh, advice I'm trying to give you. And I believe that if we learn to pray that way, in the end, the prayers of the saints will hit and purse our heart as music can hit our heart, as a personal emotion, a bereavement, a joy can hit us at the heart. And if we do this, then praying becomes true. Well, very often it's an act of politeness or a lie. Or an act of slavish obedience. But to do that, we must, as Teofan de Cruz advises us to do, we must be prepared, apart from moments when we pray, to dwell on these prayers, to take one prayer and ask ourselves questions. What do these words mean? What does mercy mean? What means my brother mean? What mean all the words which I'm going to say. Ask oneself what they mean in themselves. What they mean for me within my experience. What they meant in the experience of the saint judging by the context. And then gradually we can grow into being able to say these prayers as though they were ours. Perhaps not at the scale of the saint, on a smaller scale, but on a total scale. A triangle may be small or immensely big. It remains a triangle. If this, my prayer is like a small triangle, it is an image of the great one. 
if my prayer is true, but as small as I am, it is capable of growing through truth, through experience, to towards at least the experience of the saint who wrote it. I think I will end my talk at this point. I apologize for the three minutes I have stolen from you. <laughs> And um, I am now in the hands of superior authority. I hope you'll be able to take some questions. Uh, but if, if you'd like to, we can uh, have you sit down. Uh, you no, sit down? I'll take a step. <laughs> so, uh, we're open to questions. Perhaps you could, everybody could, you could stand up and ask the question. I'm quite surprised that you mention music as a, as a way of explaining how prayers and how to pray. Because uh, when I met you 26 years or 27 years ago, I told you I, I, you like chanting in the church and, and because I like chanting. And you said, if, if heaven is full of chanting, I will ask God not to take me into heaven because I, I don't like chanting at all. <laughs> Can we change your mind or not yet? I'm not a musical person as far as the great right, uh, <coughs> works of composers is concerned because I have not been brought up uh, within this experience. But I do perceive if I may put it that with the music of words. I know the difference between reciting a psalm like a mechanic and reciting a psalm from the heart. It does not mean uh, elocution. It means that something goes into the words. I know the difference between uh, reading a poem in a mechanical way of, or perceiving deeply, because you have experienced this. And I extrapolated on music um, from what I have read and heard. But I think the analogy remains true in spite of the fact that I'm so desperately obtuse. <laughs> Your Eminence, will that be prayer in heaven? And, how, and if so, how will it differ from the prayer that we know in this world? Prayer in heaven. If by prayer you mean what I mean, communion with God, pouring out to God one's love, one's joy, pouring out before Him our amazement at the fact that He can love us in spite of what we are, then the whole relationship with God, it will be praying. Unless we reduce the word prayer at begging or that kind of activity. But um, you know from human experience, I'm sure, how it is that at times we speak to one another from the head, at times in addition to what we have got to say intellectually, what we speak about makes our heart alive. And also how, uh, when our heart is alive, we commune with one another. <coughs> and then there may be a moment when silence prevails. I'm sure that many of you have this experience of talking with one or two friends with interest. Then the evening came and you continue to sit and talk, but the voices go quieter and then there are moments of silence. 
And then a deep silence comes upon the group. And one has a feeling that that is a moment when we are together in commune. And I think this is uh, the way in which we will commune with God. But that silence does not be, be, be mute. And I can't explain anything about it because I don't know what it will be. But saints have expressed it in so many ways. Uh, a man like St. Isaac of Syria, who is not uh, a light-minded man, said that the eternal occupation of the angels is the dance. Because by that he meant emotion which embodies the silence. And I remember um, in Orthodox Greek theologian uh, Nisiotis, who was General Secretary of the Ecumenical Council of Churches at a certain moment, who went to Russia. And he came back and he said to me, you know, I have discovered what prayer is. And I said, uh, how? He said, I went to the ballet and I saw such and such ballerina dancing. There was total collectedness perfect inner silence that expressed itself in the harmony of movement. So, you see that uh, he had learned something from something which we do not habitually connect with mystical experience. And the same is true about a variety of ways in which we can perceive and experience things. Uh, the tune of a voice, the manner in which things are said, I love Russian uh, poetry, and I know the difference between someone reciting a poem and someone receiving it in his heart. On the other hand, an intellectual, brilliant approach, which is not connected with this arrow piercing your own heart, may kill it to others. I remember many years ago, um, when people like Father Alexander Schmemann and Father John Mandor were still little crawlers, <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Zander asked um, a very well-known preacher in Paris to give a lesson to the Sunday school. The leaders were seated all around, the children were in the middle, and Father gave his talk. It was absolutely entrancing. I was one of the leaders, so I do remember. It was wonderful. It was intentional, well construed, spoken well. But it was too perfectly construed. And the perfection of the construction made it inaccessible to children. Because when after the talk, Professor Zander caught a little boy of seven and said, well, little boy, how did you like the talk you have heard? The little boy said, entertaining. He said that father doesn't believe a word of what he says. <laughs> and it was rigorously untrue, because he was one of the most wonderful priests we had in Paris. But he had uh, turned into an intellectual statement that was miles above the understanding of the children, something that was an inner experience he possessed. And that is what I mean by the music of words or the choice of words, the construction of things. Yes. Can I, can I just repeat so that everybody hears? Uh, what, what do you do 
uh, when you can't pray at all, and when you sometimes feel that silence is the only thing you can do. What do, what do you do when you, you can't feel anything at all and uh, don't have anything to pray? When you cannot feel anything at all, be absolutely honest and true. True to yourself and true to God. And I'll give you one more shameful example of my life. You know, I have nothing but shameful experiences to share with you. Once during the liturgy, I read the Gospel aloud. It reaches me not. I knew the words. I have read them hundreds of times, but they just slid over me. And then I thought, what can I do about preaching? I'm supposed to preach on this gospel. What can I do? It has not reached me. And I came out and said, today Christ has been speaking personally to me in the gospel. All I could say to him is I'm not interested and what you say is irrelevant. And therefore I cannot preach a sermon to you. But I will address myself to you and say, did it happen ever to you when the, you read the gospel at home, when you read the prayer, when you heard the gospel in church? Did it ever happen that you heard it and said, oh yes, yes, I've heard that hundreds of times. And if it's true, feel what I feel. Horror at the thought that Christ was standing here in the form of the Gospel, speaking to me personally, to me alone, because Christ speaks to each of us alone when the Gospel is read, not to a crowd. And I could say only, it is your right. You could have kept silent, it would not have made any difference. Ask yourself. So we may not feel anything, but then you must be true and say so. And if we say so, we may feel shame or pain or regret, even regret. I'm sorry, it didn't reach me. But this is still truth related to God. George. Uh, sorry. Years, yes, years ago, in the other Cambridge, Father George Borowski told me there are three kinds of prayer. Prayers of petition, supplication, prayers of thanksgiving, and prayers of adoration. It seems to me, however, that these are not sharply uh, divided from each other because each would contain elements of the other two. Uh, am I wrong? You are certainly not wrong, because you have with your background Father George Florovsky <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> but George, you are right, even in your own rights. Um, These different prayers have their values and their significance, which is very definite in the context in which we are. Because we are not yet in heaven. We are not yet in the perfect uh, encounter of communion with God. There is distance between him, him and us. But um, we, mu we must present these prayers knowing that we are speaking in an imperfect way to our God and that um, we must do it in the spirit of an encounter that is, he is there he can listen to us he can treat us as parents or teachers, or friends,
can teach a child. He, he can accept the imperfection of what we say, but he sees what there is in our heart. The problem is this. If you say words of adoration, and there is no adoration in your heart, it's a tragedy. If you uh, say words of repentance, and there is only an objective knowledge that I have been wrong, but I feel nothing about it, it's tragic. That is, is uh, essential. We must place ourselves in God's presence and ask ourselves, what I say, to the extent to which I can uh, say things, is it true? Am I being true to myself and to God? And then it, it is acceptable. But if it is simply um, words of politeness, or words destined to shield me from God's wrath. I'm sorry, don't beat me. No. We must pass a judgment about what is in our mind and heart. Two more questions. James? Let me take I ask you something about uh, public prayer, in other words, liturgical prayer. Uh, you said that if you read prayers for others, nonetheless they must hit you in the heart if they are to have the necessary effect. But if we read uh, prayers in the liturgy, we're expected to adopt certain technical conventions, uh, and especially to chant them, which I've always understood is intended to cut out any personal expression from the reading. Uh, if that's the case, how, how, how can the hitting me in the heart? Well, first of all, doesn't the, the technique tend to get in the way of that? But doesn't it also get in the way of the communication with the people listening? <coughs> if we read, or seen prayers, there are two ways in which they affect us and others. I may read a prayer in a very even manner because it moves me so deeply. I may read it with pathos, although it doesn't move me very much. I may sing, or if I'm a deacon or a priest, read the prayer almost emotionally with the hope that it will create emotion in others. That is a mistake. What we must do is to read or sing the prayer in all honesty. That is, speak to God and not for the benefit of anyone listening to it. Speak to God. Whatever tune we use, if we speak to God from within ourselves, <coughs> people will perceive it. If we are artistic in our praying, they may appreciate our art, but they may not reach the prayer. I remember a priest in France who had been um, a Cossack in the cavalry and he took things with a sword. <coughs> For him, the words were the words. And I remember the first time he celebrated, he blessed the holy gift. <coughs> 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 and an old priest who was standing by him said to him, Father Baris, do it in a milder way, like this. And he looked and said, that's the way we were used, uh, we were taught to use our swords in the cavalry sir. <laughs> well, that is an example of how one can uh, use words in a very military manner. There are uh, other occasions when um, 
we can try to put meaning in words in the hope that they will reach people. The trouble is that the meaning which we put in may not be at all the meaning that would reach the person. So we must say words of prayer in a meaningful manner, that is, not throw them out. Uh, speak as we would speak, not to the invisible God, but to God <coughs> in our presence, without particular emotion because he understands everything, but with earnestness. Then it will reach people. I don't know that I can uh, say more, anything more. I'm, I'm going to reserve the last question to my to myself. Uh, I don't want to exhaust the uh, uh, Here we are, <coughs> studying theology, studying texts, uh, reading books, writing essays. Uh, what um, what counsel can you give all of us about how we should be studying theology and how it relates to everything that you've said today? It's a question which I hardly can answer, having never studied theology <laughs> and knowing nothing about it. But theology is a knowledge of God as acquired in the experience of the total church, saints and sinners. Because there are sinners who know God very deeply, well, people who are more virtuous they are, don't. So that it's not a question of being a saint or a sinner, but of knowing God. And so what we find in theology is the knowledge which the total church has of God revealed in Christ, conveyed to us in the Holy Spirit. That means that it is not enough to remember in our mind, in our brain, the statements of the fathers or of the great writers. It means that at every step we must ask ourselves, out of what personal knowledge did this statement come? Let me try to share however little to touch the hem of this garment. And allow a little seed to fall into my heart and mind, and another one, and another one. If you want to pass exams, of course you must know what such and such spiritual writer wrote. But that does not imply that you are expected by the examiner to uh, have experienced it all yourself. It means that you have been confronted with it, that you have tried to take it in intellectually, that you have struggled with its meaning in your heart, tried when it offers itself for it to implement it in your life and you state what you know about it. I don't think I can say anything more. Well, Vika, thank you very, very much for being uh, here and giving of, your, of yourself and your experience. Uh,